Hello and welcome to the BSE TSR-2, which was a strike and reconnaissance aircraft program from the 1950s and 60s. Whilst the aircraft was not put into production, it is an interesting thing to explore nonetheless. And in this video, I'm going to take you on a detailed tour of it. I'm Paul Stewart and I make videos about planes and a few rockets. These include guided tours around interesting aircraft in museums and reviews of flights across the world. If you're into these types of videos, then please check out my channel and subscribe. And a massive thanks to the Imperial War Museum in Duxford for letting me film this aircraft. Keep an eye out for many other videos I captured during my visit here. The English Electric Canberra Bomber was impressive for its time, but by the mid-1950s, a replacement was needed. General Operations Requirement 339 stated that they needed an aircraft capable of flying fast at both high and low altitude, in any weather, a long range, and carry nukes. Importantly, it also had to have good short field performance as well. The British Aircraft Corporation won the contract with the TSR-2, which stood for Tactical Strike and Reconnaissance Mark II, and development began. Of interest, TSR has been used before, although it referred to torpedo spotter and reconnaissance and led to the fairy swordfish that famously incapacitated the Bismarck with a single strike. But I digress and back to the modern jet version. It was to feature a crew of two with the pilot sitting forward and the navigator sitting behind him. The TSR-2 could guide itself to the target, with the pilot observing its progress, with the important information being projected onto a heads-up display in front of them, and the windscreens were also extra strong due to the risk of bird strikes flying at such lower altitudes than usual. Right at the tip of the probe was the pitot head, followed by the ray dome, and then the radar scanner for the train following radar system. The pilot could select the preferred height above the terrain and the degree of discomfort that the crew could tolerate to ensure the aircraft remained at that height. Then the system would ascend and descend the aircraft without further input needed from the pilot. If there was a problem, the system would automatically climb, allowing the pilot to well, wake up and regain control. You can see the warning signs for the Martin Baker ejection seats. It had zero zero capability, which meant that it could operate from ground level and still power the seat high enough that there would be time for the parachute to activate and slow the return to the ground. It could also survive ejections at Mach 2 and up to 56,000 feet. The navigator could eject alone or the pilot could eject both, but the navigator would still fire first as to avoid a collision between the two. Under the panel, here was a sideways looking navigation radar. This would observe one or both sides of the aircraft's track, identifying topographical features that could be compared with known points allowing the aircraft to identify its exact location along the planned route. This was meant to be more accurate than Doppler radar and inertial referencing systems. Now it's not fitted to this aircraft, but located here could be an in-flight refueling probe. There was also plans for buddy refueling too, which means that it could refuel another TSR-2 during a deep penetration attack. Here's the nose wheel, which is interesting because it could actually be extended in height by 30 inches to give it a nose up attitude and reduce takeoff distance. An important requirement was that this could take off in a very short distance, with the idea being that it's possible that the runway may be damaged, therefore they may only have one third of it left. Underneath we have a replica WE-177 Freefall Gravity Nuclear Bomb. This was designed to carry up to four of these, with two inside the weapons bay and two on external underwing pylons or a single red beard or two OR-1177 nuclear weapons. Alternatively, it could also carry up to six 1,000 pound conventional bombs. Extra fuel tanks and even a reconnaissance pod could be installed in here as well. There were four underwing pylons, which could be fitted and carry either extra fuel tanks, bombs and even missiles. Now let's talk about these engines. It had two Bristol Siddeley Olympus turbojets, which were from the Avro Vulcan and eventually installed into the Concorde. Now sadly, it won't make that same howl as the unique noise came from the Vulcan's air intakes. Now looking at these air intakes, you have the boundary layer bleed duct, as you don't want this entering the engines. Then it's ducted up above the aircraft. This is a movable center body, which moves fore and aft depending on the aircraft's speed and creates a shock wave inside the duct, which then itself slows the incoming supersonic air down so that it can be ingested by the engines. Now unlike the Vulcans, these were fitted with reheaters, also known as afterburners, and provided 22,000 pounds each of thrust, or 30,600 pounds once the reheaters were activated. These powered it to a top speed of Mach 2.1 at 40,000 feet, and Mach 1.1 at sea level. 
The Olympus 320-22 Romeo was first fitted to the underside of an Avro Vulcan X-ray Alpha 894 and began flight tests in 1962. It was actually so powerful that it could keep the Vulcan flying alone without its own four engines. Unfortunately, on the 3rd of December of the same year, the engine exploded, rupturing the fuel tanks and starting a fire on the ground. The fire services were already there as a precaution, but sitting downhill and the flaming fuel actually rang down towards them and ignited the fire truck. Thankfully, no one was killed, although it was a big setback for the program. Let's check out the main landing gear, which is quite unique looking. Remember that this was expected to operate from rough runways and even grass, therefore it required larger and low pressure tubeless tyres. Compare this with the Vulcan's landing gear with its small tyres that could easily get bogged rendering the aircraft useless if a single bomb landed in the middle of the runway. It retracts forward so gravity and airflow would assist lowering it down in an emergency. Unfortunately, the long gear created significant vibrations that were the same resonant frequency as the pilot's eyeball. This rendered them briefly blind just after landing, which was a bit of a problem, so eventually they remedied the problem with an additional tyre strut on the landing gear. Now let's have a look at this very unique wing. It had a 60 degree sweep back on the leading edge and straight across along the trailing edge in a delta shape. It had a fairly small area which provided good high speed performance at Mach 1.2 at sea level, although it did limit maneuverability. It was flat with no anhedral because a slight anhedral during development was found to adversely affect the tailplane directly behind it. So to help ensure lateral stability, the wing was made straight, but with quite an obvious downward tip. They weren't designed to capture the shockwave as we saw on the American XB-70. Now the problem is that Delta wings are good at high speed but don't provide as much low speed lift and the later was a requirement for this aircraft. You may recall I mentioned earlier the ability to raise the nose wheel to help the takeoff process but this wing also featured blown flaps. You can see these vents here and the air is bled from the engines and blown through the back of the wing and over the trailing edge flaps which all improves low speed lift. It had four large air brakes and you can see the panels here, with an in-flight photo of them deployed. There's no ailerons and the roll was controlled by the large or moving tailplane. And by that I mean that the whole tailplane moves, pivoting in the centre rather than what you see with many aircraft which have a static horizontal stabiliser and a movable elevator on the trailing edge. It also has an all-moving fin as well. The hinged panel between the exhaust is where the braking parachute is located. You'll notice the XR222 registration. This was the fourth prototype and one of only two intact aircraft remaining. The other one is on display at RAF Museum Cosford. After the program was cancelled they were all meant to be destroyed, although fortunately these were somehow kept. And looking from the opposite direction you get a better understanding of the size of the wheel now that you've got a man standing next to it. This is painted in an anti-flash white paint designed to reflect some of the light from a nearby nuclear explosion. The cockpit windscreen was also covered in a gold film to protect it from a nuclear flash. You'll notice this large panel here which you might have seen on the other side and behind that is the air conditioned electronics bay. As technology increased, aircraft started carrying more electrical equipment although it was still very mechanical with many moving parts unlike modern tech with solid state hard drives for example. Of interest, the B-52's electronics bay could get so hot that they installed air vents as you can see from my tour video around one of those. And here is the side looking radar that I mentioned on the other side as well. Now it had no defensive equipment. I did see mention of electronic countermeasures during my reading, although not much was said. I expect they would have been further integrated along the developmental process. Unfortunately for the TSR-2, its biggest problem was the F-111 concurrently under development in the United States. It had very similar specifications, albeit with variable sweep wings. With continued budget overruns and delays, and pressure from across the Atlantic to buy their aircraft instead, eventually the TSR-2 program was cancelled, immediately after a new government was voted in. Interestingly, as a part of the deal, the Americans were worried that the Brits might change their mind, so they made them destroy the aircraft and all of the tooling. It was a sad end to a fascinating aircraft, but somewhat understandable. Now this might be an unpopular opinion and I'm happy to be corrected in the video comments, but as we saw with the YF-23 as well, there are a lot of people who believe quite strongly that this could have been something brilliant, if only it wasn't the corrupt reasons for it being dumped. But the reality was that the requirements were incredibly complex and it was still a very long way away from going into service. 
It's easy to make impressive claims when there's no real accountability. As we saw with the F-111, developing such a complex aircraft is a very slow and expensive process and it's highly likely that the TSR-2 would have continued to overrun timeframes and budgets. It's still an incredibly fascinating aircraft, don't get me wrong, but it's not really fair to compare this with an aircraft that actually did go into service. I guess we'll never know what it would have been like if it was given a chance. I hope you enjoyed the video and please check out my channel for other similar videos. Thanks for watching.